Well, all month we've been working through this Old Testament, uh, this series in the Old Testament book of Ruth called The Love of a Redeemer. And as we've seen, Ruth is all about facing the bitter tragedies of life, the losses, the things of times of grief, by leaning on the chesed or the steadfast loving kindness of God, of course, but also leaning on the support, the love, the encouragement, the care, the protection and the provision of the men and women that God has put in our lives, has put in our path, perhaps, who reflect the character and the integrity of God, who reflect has said, who, who reflect the redeeming love of God into our lives. The Bible from cover to cover is a redemption story. And sometimes the people of the Bible, people like Ruth and Boaz, as we've seen, they reflect the redemptive love of God that he has ultimately given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I do hope that this short series has been helpful to you. It really has been fun. It's been inspiring for me. It's really just a fantastic story. Uh, but today, in Act 4 of our play, we'll see the, that this inspiring story has an even better conclusion. We get to see the, the, the covenant love, the chesed of Boaz, that would make the cost, paying the cost of redemption, a joy and not a burden. But also, we'll see that the redeeming work that God was doing in this couple, in the lives of this family, in this community, all those years ago, would actually have, some, have an impact far beyond simply the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, because God was doing something so much greater than anyone could ever imagine. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, please take it and open it to Ruth chapter 4, starting with verse 1. But before we jump back in, while you turn to Ruth chapter 4, let me give you a little context here. So maybe it's the summertime. Maybe you missed the sermon last week. Uh, maybe this is your first time here. Welcome. Let me give you a little context before we jump into the conclusion of this story. So last week we saw that Naomi, at Naomi's suggestion, Ruth got dressed up nice. She put on some perfume. She went down to the threshing floor when Boaz and the others were winnowing the grain that they had harvested, which is kind of a celebration time at the end of the harvest. And Ruth pulled off what seemed to be a perhaps sketchy plan to go to Boaz at night and let him know that she was interested in him as more than a friend, shall we say? Well, when Boaz woke up and realized that Ruth was there, she boldly asked him if he would be willing to serve as her guardian redeemer. Now, we'll see more of exactly what it was she was asking Boaz to do today, but instead of taking advantage of Ruth there on the threshing floor, Boaz was blown away by her and responded with a blessing telling her that he would do everything that, that she had asked him to do. But there was one potential problem, and that is there was another who was a closer rel relative to Elimelech, who, according to their custom, should have the first opportunity to be the guardian redeemer ahead of Boaz. But Boaz, as Naomi predicted, would not rest until the matter was settled the very next day. And so, the scene is set. Act 4, scene 1, verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention 
and suggest you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Uh Uh-oh, okay, let's pause here. So, (laughs) was that the plan? Uh, Boaz went up from the threshing floor to the town gate. Now, I mentioned last week that Ruth clearly embodied the, the wife of noble character from Proverbs, described in Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, verse 23 says this of the husband of that kind of woman. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. Now, Ruth was really a Proverbs 31 kind of woman, but Boaz was no slouch either. Now, he too was a man of noble character and of standing who was respected there in the community of Bethlehem. So, like in verse 23 of Proverbs 31, Boaz took his seat there at the city gate. Now, back then, that was the place where official legal matters were judged and settled. Okay, so this wasn't just like a hangout. This was an official thing. Now, as if by coincidence, the other potential guardian redeemer just so happened to be walking by when Boaz sat down. Now, do you really think that was a coincidence? I think this might have been divine providence, just like when Ruth first set out and started gleaning from a field, it just so happened to be Boaz, a potential guardian redeemer. Either way, maybe it was just a coincidence. Boaz called this nameless man over, hey friend, come on over, and then assembled the 10 elders. So, So they were to serve as official witnesses for what was about to go down. Now, at the heart of the legal matter that Boaz needed to settle, Uh, was whether or not this other man was willing to be the guardian redeemer for the deceased Elimelech and his family and his land. But what exactly did that mean? Well, we don't have the role of guardian redeemer anymore. But this story takes place well over 3,000 years ago. So their culture and their social norms were very different than ours. So last week, I mentioned that the title of guardian redeemer comes from the Torah. It comes from Leviticus chapter 25 of the Mosaic law. And Leviticus 25 says that if someone has to sell their land because they become desperately poor, a member of their extended family would have the right to redeem, to buy back the land from whoever bought it. Now, this guardian redeemer would be able to use that land until the year of Jubilee, which came every 50 years. And that year was when the time was kind of a great reset. All the debts would be forgiven, and the land that was sold in the intervening 50 years would be returned back to the the original owner and their family. So Boaz approached this nameless relative very tactfully. as a good approach, saying that he wanted to bring this matter to his attention, and then if this man wanted to redeem this land, Boaz would respect that. But he also implies that if this man isn't interested, Boaz is, and he's next in line. Okay, so hopefully we understand what's happening right now. And how does the man reply? Well, he says, I will redeem it. Commentator Daniel Block writes, if Ruth was watching, which probably would have been, right? Her heart must have sunk. You see, this was the first legal step toward Boaz and Ruth being able to get married. And it looked like their plan was immediately falling apart. Would that stop Boaz? Let's see. Verse 5. Well, then Boaz said... On the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. 
You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Okay, so Boaz apparently knew the law because after referring to Leviticus 25 regarding redeeming the land, he then brought up Deuteronomy 25, which deals with what to do if a brother dies and leaves his widow without any children. The brother was supposed to marry the widow, and according to the law, the first son she bears shall carry the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. It's Deuteronomy 25, verse 6. This practice was culturally common, and it was known as leverate marriage. Okay, now, granted, this is going to seem strange to us, right? We do not have this cultural practice. Very different time and place. But this was normal for them. This practice was concerned not only for providing a vulnerable widow some protection and provision, but also for honoring the man, the name of the man who had died. Now, as we've said, for them, in their time and place, a husband meant security and sons meant hope for the future. But when this relative says he's willing to redeem the land, Boaz mentions that the situation's a little more complicated. It's not just the land. Given the situation with not only Ruth, but Naomi, there was an elderly widow who needed to be taken care of, as well as a young, childless widow. Now, in this brief story, in this brief account, it's not clear that if this man, this potential guardian redeemer, it's, 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 clear that, it's not clear that this man would have been legally obligated to marry Ruth. Even Deuteronomy 25 has a provision that if a brother was not willing to take on this responsibility, uh, it would be shameful, but it would be allowed. But seeking to provide a home and children for Ruth certainly would have been in the spirit of the law and would have been seen in their culture, there in Bethlehem, it would have been seen by the community as the right thing to do. Now, no offense to Ruth or Naomi, but this was too much for our potential guardian redeemer. He's not willing to take on their, this responsibility because he says he doesn't want to endanger his own estate. Now, perhaps he knows that he will not be able to protect and to provide for these women financially. Or maybe he knows that this will cause too much conflict with his own family, if he has his own family already. Or, or maybe he couldn't stomach the idea of taking on a Moabite woman for his wife. There was cultural tension there, right? But for whatever reason, the narrator doesn't say, he wants out. Now, of course, this is exactly what Boaz and Ruth were hoping for. And whoever this character was, it doesn't seem like he would have been a great option for Ruth since he doesn't even have a name in our story. Uh, but in how he handled this whole situation, Boaz showed uh, a lot of his character. Again, he showed his faithfulness to do for Ruth what he promised to do. He showed his commitment to knowing and obeying the law of God. He showed his respect for this relative, treating him fairly and rightfully, whoever he was, whatever kind of guy he was. And he showed his desire to do the right thing in the eyes of the community there in Bethlehem. And remember, he didn't take advantage of Ruth through this whole situation. In other words, Boaz followed the right path. And now he had the opportunity that he hoped for to be her guardian redeemer. Verse 7. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and the transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malone. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malone's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, 
You are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. That was very meaningful. Maybe some of us know none of those biblical names, but that was a big deal in their day. Now, here again, we see, we see Boaz's commitment to marrying Ruth, to honoring and providing for Naomi, and redeeming the land and the family name of Elimelech. Now, most critically, Boaz got the official sandal before the witnesses, which meant that the matter was settled. Now, I appreciate verse 7. It's a little bit of an explanation of the whole sandal business, uh, which is helpful, right? Thank you. That probably means that this story was written later, perhaps during the time of the kings later, so that they needed, the original audience needed that explanation too. What happened with the sandal? Okay, deal is done. That also means Boaz and Ruth are legally married. Uh, it also means that Boaz has promised to buy back Elimelech's land and to use it uh, to provide for this, his new family. They'll make sure that Naomi is taken care of and Ruth has her guardian redeemer. Now, in response to this beautiful turn of events, the people break out in a blessing. And if this were a musical, I think this would be the big final number where every, the chorus comes and everyone starts singing. Uh, they ask the Lord, Yahweh God, the God of their ancestors, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They ask Yahweh God, the maker of the heavens, the heavens and the earth, to bless this couple. And they ask the Lord that he would provide for Ruth children and provide for Boaz a good name and reputation in their community. They asked the Lord that this new family would be like that of Perez, who was one of their ancestors, one of the sons of Judah. In other words, they asked the Lord that he would allow them to fulfill the original blessing of God over humanity from Genesis chapter 1, which was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, let's finish our story with a little bit of an epilogue starting in verse 13, and this takes place perhaps nine months later. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The, woman, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age, literally in your gray hair. I like that part. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Abinadab the father of Nishon, Nishon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. This is God's word. So our story started with a tragedy but ended with a happily ever after. Now, we started with famine and Elimelech's decision to move his family to Moab where they encountered just unimaginable loss. Eventually, Naomi returned to Bethlehem in Judah as a bitter older woman with only her foreign daughter-in-law, Ruth, and a lot of worry for the future. But through the providence of God and through the good character and the integrity, through the hesed of Ruth and Boaz, our story finds redemption and new life. 
our lead characters do find security and joyful hope for the future. Naomi, who returned to Bethlehem empty, now has a daughter who loves her and is better to her than seven sons. And she now has a little grandbaby to care for too, little Obed. What a blessing. Now this by itself would have been an incredibly satisfying end to our story, right? Well, there's one more detail that makes this story truly amazing. Again, commentator Daniel Block writes, quote, these characters could not know what long-range fruit their compassionate and loyal conduct towards each other would bear. But we know. Our narrator tells us that little Obed would grow up and one day he would become the father of a man named Jesse, who is also the father of David. And what this means is that Boaz and Ruth became the great-grandparents of David, who became the most famous king of ancient Israel. So this story was not only a story of God demonstrating his chesed, his loyal, covenantal, sacrificial love to protect and provide for Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. This is also a story of God doing something so much more. He was protecting the lineage of, of the king who would bring peace and prosperity to his people. After this terrible chapter of history, which was the time of the judges of Israel. Isn't that amazing? Only God could weave together these threads in such a way that would form a tapestry that would bless his people for generations. Was anything in this story a coincidence? Well, today, we are in a very time, different time and place. But will we face loss? Will we face bitter tragedies in this broken world? Most likely. Will we face situations that test our character and our integrity? Will we have to decide whether or not we're going to follow the way of Jesus, even if it's very costly? Absolutely. Boaz and Ruth provide great examples of what it looks like to reflect the steadfast loving kindness of God. And through their story, we see what God is able to do as our true guardian redeemer. But what is truly incredible is to think that through the lineage of Ruth and Boaz, a thousand years later, another child would be born in Bethlehem. Like Obed, his conception was a gift of God as well. Like Obed, he too would be one who would provide security and hope for the future, but, but not only for his parents and not only for his grandmother, but this son would provide security and hope for the entire world. In Matthew chapter 1, in the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, Matthew provides another genealogy that traces the ancestry of Jesus back to none other than Ruth and Boaz. So today, when you put your faith and your trust in this God and in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ, you just never know what that God will do. Amen. You never know what God will do in your current life that may have an impact on generations to come. Only he can do something like this. For he is our guardian, and he is our redeemer. And as great a blessing as a godly husband or a godly wife, as, as great and wonderful as a blessing as the blessing of, of children and new life is, our God is so much more. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. This is the story of Ruth. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so blessed to hear again another story of your faithfulness and your goodness to men and women who were really good and godly, but Lord, they weren't perfect, and we know that. But still, Lord, you worked in their lives. You wove the threads of their lives together into something far more beautiful than they could ever have asked for or even imagined. That through their family, you would provide the rescuer, you would provide the ultimate redeemer who would be able to provide redemption and newness of life and forgiveness of sins and life everlasting in your kingdom and, at, and in your family, Lord. What an amazing story you are working even today. I pray, Father, that we would have a renewed sense of joy and expectation in who you are and your goodness. I pray, Lord, that you would have, that you would inspire us by the redemptive power and work of your son Jesus and Holy Spirit. I pray that we would be full of joy and hope as we not only tell this story to others, but as we become part of this story through our faith in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.